welcome everyone. Uh, nice to see some of you again and welcome if this is the first time you've come to a local stories. This has become a fairly regular uh, event in lockdown at the museum since Christmas. We've been running them fortnightly and the aim of the program is to tell the history of local people and places. So we've covered the Weller family and looked at some stories that hadn't been told before. We've looked at architecture, emigre artists and today uh, we're looking at the census and as I'm sure you all had your letter in the post and might have already filled your census in online but officially the census date is this Sunday the 21st of March. So it seemed a great opportunity to look at the census, why we have it and to also talk a little bit about how we use it in the museum and we're also going to look a little bit about if you want to use the census for your research, some of the things to think about, some of the potential pitfalls or some tips for accessing the census. And today to help us find all of that out, we've got a very uh, special guest, which is Gwyneth Wilkie. She is a volunteer at the museum and she's been interested in family history for over 20 years. Uh, she's volunteered with the Society of Genealogists in various roles and in her words from stuffing leaflets into plastic bags to working on the advice line and I'm sure they're both equally important. Um, she was uh, uh, one of the members of the U U3A family history groups who researched the First World War uh, casualties that are on our local war memorials and I'm going to be touching on that later and she's written quite a few articles uh, for us which are on the museum website including a couple about the census and also one about the Amersham British School. So we're going to start the session today with a sort of Q&A really about the census. Um, just let someone else in uh, and Gwyneth has uh, agreed to answer all my questions that I have about the census. So Gwyneth if you're ready then we'll keep going. Uh, can you tell us how you got so interested in the census? Oh, well, I suppose I started family history really in pre-digital times, and the census was only available to use with great difficulty. So everything you found was a real triumph. And now you can do in one evening what once would have taken several years. And I've done a lot of courses at the Society of Genealogists, where they tell you repeatedly that you get more out of a record if you pay attention to why, how, and by whom it was created, and even perhaps how it's been kept since. And I'd like to add that the more you learn, the more interesting it becomes because you notice more as you go. I also belong to um, a group called Thatchers. I'll try and say this once. It's the Family and Community Historical Research Society. Um, and every year they do a mini project asking you to research, for example, the life of a, a local governess, a local being Amersham in this case, postmistress, bank manager, something like that. So one year they did census enumerators and I listed all our Amersham ones and then I wrote that background piece for the museum website. And grumbles about pay are mentioned in all the standard textbooks on the census but there was no single source where the standard rates of pay could actually be checked. Well, now there is, and it's part of our museum website. Later on, I came across a pay related incident, which um, again, we added to the website. And how that came about was, was almost eerie really. Because I went one Tuesday evening to hear Dave Annell's talk on the enumerator strikes back. And the following morning, I was supposed to talk to my U3A group about um, using the National Archives. So I needed to empty my mind of everything Dave Annell had been talking about and, and wrench it round to TNA, the National Archives. So on the way to bed, I grabbed a book by Stella Colwell, who once upon a time was actually my bus prefect when we were at school. And um, far from sending me to sleep with a happy sort of wander around the archives, it electrified me because it mentioned the murder, later reduced to manslaughter, of a registrar by an angry enumerator. And I knew that certainly wasn't in any of the standard textbooks. So, um, you know, once again, we put it up on the website where maybe somebody will discover it one of these days. So it's really interesting to hear how you became interested. Why is there interest in the census now? Well, I suppose it's a hot topic because of what you were saying about, you know, we've got to fill in our details by Sunday. 
but also family historians are getting excited because they're waiting for the release of the 1921 census, which was promised for January and I think is sort of slipping back because of COVID, but sometime next year we'll get to see the next census we're allowed to. Which will be great because there'll be so much, um, you know, people will want to find out. I know we're excited about that in the museum. Um, on the flip side, it's going to be the last uh, census that we're going to have access to for quite some time, isn't it? I'm afraid it is, yes. The 1931 census was completely burnt in a warehouse fire in 1942, and that had nothing to do with enemy action. And there are lots of quite imaginative um, conspiracy theories about why it was burnt down. Um, and the official inquiry only got as far as speculating that one of the fire watchers in this well-protected building might have dropped a cigarette end and started it all, but the, it was completely burned. Everything was just reduced to ashes. And the 1941 census obviously never took place because of the war, but as a part substitute, we can already look at the 1939 register. And that was taken on the night of the 29th of September, 1939 so that identity cards and eventually ration cards could be issued to the civilian population. So it doesn't cover anybody who was um, in the forces by then. And it doesn't include the same amount of information. There's nothing about relationships or um, um, place of birth. But what you do get is a precise birthday in it, which is really handy. And the other great thing is that um, people continued to annotate it until 1991. And um, so you get them adding married names for women, which again is really useful because that um, time in the 20s and 30s can be quite difficult to research really, and the 40s for tracing people. And so you can see, um, you know, refugees and, and other people moving into the Amersham area who are sometimes very interesting people and also people interested in researching the history of their house or the history of their street can use this. You just need to be aware that sometimes extra entries or notes were added at the end of each booklet. So it's always worth scrolling forward until you find the, you know, the end of that particular section. And it also um, contains notes about people's wartime roles, such as being ARP wardens or whatever. It's certainly a really useful resource for us. I'm going to touch on that later of how we've used it in the museum. So if we go back to the beginning, can you tell us how census taking started? Ah, um, well, it goes an awfully long way back. Um, I don't know exactly when it started, but certainly um, Caesar Augustus's decree that all the world should be taxed was a sort of census because it involved a kind of head count of taxpayers and it required Joseph and Mary to return to Bethlehem. And that might even be one underlying reason why numbering the people is so strongly associated in everybody's mind with taxation. And in this country, you've got a lot of earlier part listings of people. Um, they're mostly to do with raising money, such as the hearth tax or religion, like the protestation oaths. And also militia lists recorded men of military age who could be called up and some could send a substitute if they wanted. So the Posse Comitatus came about because of the Napoleonic Wars, and that was to see who could be sent to fight. And I think you've made the Amersham section of that available, haven't you? Because it's difficult to pull together. Yes. So that's mainly um, a list of men for military service, but it does include some women. For example, if they could supply a horse, then they get listed. And it's also fascinating because it tells you about people who'd had arms or legs amputated or were blind and therefore were not so good for military service. I just don't know how else you might find that out about your ancestors. And Buckinghamshire has is, is got the only, I think, complete um, posse commissatus, so we're, we're very well catered for. But census taking as we think of it, that's something intended to include everybody, women, children, everyone, started in this country in 1801 and it had been resisted since the 1750s as the end of English liberty and all the rest 
Um, so was Cromwell's decree that um, parish registers should be kept back in the 1550s. But those 10 year listings from 1801 to 1831 and not much use for us because they're simply a head count for statistical purposes. And some lists do survive with names and a bit more detail, mostly scattered in county archives. But the 1841 was the first to attempt to record everybody by name. And why did they bother to do that? Why did they go to so much effort? <laughs> well, I think the government wanted to know the size of the population and how it was made up. And um, towards the end of the 18th century, there was quite a fear that the population was growing so fast we might actually run out of food. And they wanted to monitor growth and see how the population was made up, how people moved around and what sort of occupations they followed. And it wasn't only national and local government officials who were hungry for reliable statistics. You've got medical researchers, insurance companies, um, all sorts of people really wanted that information. And the Registrar General actually ran a very good statistics department. Um, Dr. William Farr, I think, is probably the best known of his people. But their systems were sensitive enough to detect fraud by registrars who attempted to line their pockets by registering um, deaths or births, which actually hadn't taken place. They just wanted the fee for putting it in. And in 1851, they also carried out a religious census. Again, I think we've got details on the museum website and an educational census, but that was the only time they did that. So are they all the same? Are the censuses all the same? No, um, if you want to know the precise differences, there's a very good detailed list on the National Archives online guide, but Basically, there was a constant tussle going on between officials who wanted more and more information and the Registrar General who had to keep the cost down and also knew perfectly well from experience that if you sent people a complicated form, you wouldn't get very good information back. So in the, the two anomalous ones really are at the two ends, 1841 and 1911. So ages were rounded down in 1841 and the place of birth, you can only tell because you're asked the question, were you born within this county? That's where the census was taking place. So yes or no, or you occasionally get I for Ireland or S for Scotland um, or even F for France actually. Um, and the relationship to the head of household is not specified. So you have to be careful there. Uh, you make assumptions as you read it, but you've got to remember those are only assumptions. And for censuses, all of them up to 1901, we see not the household schedules, the bit the actual people filled in, but the census enumerators book into which all this stuff was copied. So that has an advantage because if an entry is difficult to read, then you can look at the other pages and try and get your eye in before going for the nugget of information you really, really want. Um, the uh, authorities were supposed only to employ people with legible handwriting, but that doesn't seem always to have happened as I'm sure you'll find out. Then 1911 is very different because for the first time ever, you see the schedules, um, the bit filled in by the householder, um, people get very excited because at last they can see their ancestors handwriting. Um, but it can be a bit of a mixed blessing because you can't get your eye in on if somebody's handwriting is difficult. You've only got that form. And the other thing is that some people are extremely unhelpful and list themselves as Mr. Brown, Mrs. Brown, Master Brown, Miss Brown and Baby Brown, which is not great. Married women, um, very helpfully, were asked to state for how long they'd been married, how many children they'd had, and how many were alive or dead. And that's very useful. And sometimes those details are also given by widows and widowers and other people who weren't supposed to do that. And the figures were then crossed out um, later on by the clerks, but you can still read them and get the information from them. And this was also the census which made Roger the Airedale famous 
and I don't think he would ever have made it into a, an enumerator's book, do you? Wasn't it all, isn't 1911 also significant because it was the census where some of the suffragettes didn't want to fill it in? Yes, it was. Um, their slogan was, if women don't count, neither shall they be counted. And so you see a number of variations of that phrase um, on the form. Um, some husbands uh, wrote something in support and some overruled their rebellious wives and, you know, said, silly thing, I'm going to fill this in. Um, Emily Wilding Davison, as no doubt you know, hid in the House of Commons. And there's also a book being written on the subject. It's some um, Vanishing for the Vote by um, Jill Liddington. So I think um, you, Emily, and Alison and I have all looked in vain for any echo of this in Amersham. Um, and the nearest thing I can offer you is in Hertfordshire, where Mary Howard, Howie, in the infirmities column, wrote, not enfranchised. And it's not only suffragettes who are known for using avoidance tactics. Um, the artist Turner spent the night of the 1841 census in a rowing boat in the middle of the Thames. Good job it was summer for that census. Um, Punch joked, you know, the suffragettes have definitely taken leave of their census. <laughs> Why did Turner do that? What was his protest? Do you know? No, I don't. I've only just come across the information, so I'm, I'm looking forward to pursuing that. But yeah. I don't know. I mean, a lot of people did object to the government, you know, and busybodies poking their nose into their business sort of thing. And I suppose it was newer in those days. Yeah. Yeah. No, well, I suppose privacy, you know, like then just as now, was important to people. Mm. So could you just tell us a little bit about why family and other historians are so keen on the census? Why is it so valuable to them? Well, um, I suppose it's because, unlike other records, you actually find people in their family groupings. And if you follow them through various censuses, you can see how their lives developed. You know, their children arriving, their jobs changing, their place changing. Um, with luck, you can find out where the parents are born and then hop back another generation. Uh, where their children are born often reveals how they moved around. And then that leads you to other records, you know, associated with a particular place or job or whatever it is. You might be lucky and find three or even four generations together, which is very helpful. And also by just looking at the neighbourhood and the neighbours, you can get quite a feeling for you know, the local economy and the, the context of people's lives, really. But it's very important, um, now that we can do this thing at speed, not to rush to believe what you see or what you think you see. And it's often said that you need to collect all the census entries for any individual and then try and take the average and also pursue, you know, the anomalies. So you need to check everything against other records wherever possible. We can look at specific problems, you know, and ways of doing that later, but um, this is simply a brilliant resource and using it with any luck, you can work your ancestry back to the early 1800s. Brilliant, thank you. I, I know that's certainly how I've used it for my family and I've done that in lockdown, like probably many of you have too. Um, thank you, Gwyneth. That's a really great introduction and an overview about the census. We've got time now for questions. I suspect a few people might have some. We're, in our next session, we are going to apply some of the things that Gwyneth has told us about to how we've used the census in Amersham and then talk about a few pitfalls. But if you've got questions about using the census or questions about the history of the census itself, either you can use the chat function, which is at the bottom of your screen, write in a question, or if you're not sure about that, you can unmute yourself and ask a question. Hi, Emily. Hi, Annie. Hello, Gwyneth. Hello, Gwyneth. It's lovely Hello. to see you and meet you. Could you tell us about two things that you mentioned? Mm -hmm. The half tax, if I heard that correctly. Yes. And Roger the Airedale. <laughs> well, should we start with Roger the Airedale? Because that's less complicated. Um, it was because of 
households being able to fill in their own schedule. So you do get quite a few comments and a number of pets mentioned, including Roger the Airedale. And I think since then, um, cat lovers have sort of struck back and found, you know, Samuel the Mouser and Tibby the something else, <laughs> just to balance things up between cat and dog. The um, hearth tax, I can't remember the exact date. Um, oh dear, I think it's 16, 1670 something, something like that. But people were taxed according to the size, size of their houses. And so they went around counting up the hearths. And um, so if you find somebody with five hearths in their house, you, you know they were worth quite a lot of money and therefore should pay quite a lump of tax. Huh. Uh, most cottages just had one hearth, you know, around which the family life evolved. If you read inventories crossing over from the 16th to the 17th century, um, you find um, more hearths occurring, you know, so you perhaps had a living room and a kitchen, that sort of thing. Gosh. Mm. And then, of course, you had the window tax. Which yes, I was just going to mention that. Their yeah. windows up. You've also got tax on wig powder and uh, on wig powder. So that must have been a, intended as a sort of tax on luxuries, I think, don't you? Wow, well, wow. Well. Mm. Very interesting, though. Thank you. Wig powder feels very appropriate at the moment when we're all desperate to go oh. to the hairdressers, uh, doesn't it? Tell me. <laughs> I nearly thought I'd better wear a hat for this session, just for <laughs> in the public interest, as it were. <laughs> Thank you, Annie, for your questions. Does anyone else have a question? Nobody? I've got another one. Sorry if anybody's not no, going to ask. Fine, go on. In the 1921 census, Gwyneth, mm -hmm. you said was coming out soon. Do you, know, do, you know, do you know when that is? No, um, it was promised for January. What, um, this year? Yes, uh, next year, January, you know, 2021. Find my past, have the contract. But the problem is when COVID struck, then the National Archives stopped people coming in to film stuff. And so the whole thing has been pushed right back, I think. So um, they're still saying late spring, but I suspect that is likely to be summer, frankly. Okay, thank um, you. And I should have said about the hearth tax, it, um, again, it's a tax that is mostly dealing with men because you just want the head of household recorded, you know, because they're the one paying the tax. Thank you. There was a book you said that was quite interesting, written by Stella somebody or other. I couldn't catch- Oh, Stella Colwell, yep. Um, she's written quite a few. She, um, she, well, when she left school, she went to Keel University where she did history. Then she started um, some sort of apprenticeship, I think, at the College of Arms. And then she worked at the National Archives. And that's the book I, um, I actually looked at. It's called The National Archives, yeah. Practical Guide for Family Historians by Stella Colwell. So that's um, uh, fairly old fashioned in a way. If you want a, a detailed book on the National Archives, um, then this has rather overtaken it, Amanda Bevan, tracing your ancestors in the yeah. National Archives. But Stella was, um, she was amazing really. She was known as the first lady of genealogy for a while. And she made a lot of these really obscure um, records in the National Archives accessible and showed family historians the sort of stuff they could find in them. So she was a real trailblazer, I think. I mean, that's quite interesting because if you want to know purely who they're employed by, not who, but what they did mm. and their family did. So it's quite interesting to, to, to be guided by that. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Gwyneth, can I just clarify that the 1921 census is, it will be available spring next year, 2022. That's what they hope, yes. yes. Not, not this spring. Yeah. Yes. It looks like not January, but as soon as they can after that. Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, Alison, you've got your hand up. Yeah. Hi, Gwyneth. Hi. Um, the question on the 1921 census, is there some more information in there that we haven't yet re um, recorded in census before? Um, I'm, I think 
the last thing I looked up said that we were going to have the same as the 1911, which is the sort of fertility bits about the length of marriage and so on. I have a feeling there is something extra. Is it about occupations? Do you, do you know, Alison? No, I don't know. So it's a while since I looked it up. Um, oh, dear. No, it's not. Um, I'm terribly sorry. It's sort of lost in the sludge of my mind at the moment, but maybe I shall remember before the session is over. Um, it's something to do with going further back in people's lives. Um, Don't worry, we can try. If I remember, I can always let you know anyway, and I'm sorry I can't dredge it up just at the moment. No, thank you. Can I ask a question about the enumerators in the, well, let's take, let's say 1851, 1861. Mm -hmm. um, I'd always imagined that they, that they knocked on the doors uh, and did they complete the form on behalf of the householder um, or did they allow some householders to to write the answers and then collect them up and then copy them out or uh, I mean a lot of people at that time wouldn't have been able to write very well and or very neatly so how did that work that's very true um well they were obviously local people who were appointed and who went around a locality they knew pretty well. Um, and like you say, in the early censuses, literacy was not tremendously high. So although they were issued with forms, you know, one for each household, they'd probably call and explain things and then perhaps fill the thing in themselves. But um, as time went on, things got a lot easier. There are just a few... Um, schedules which survive although they shouldn't they were all supposed to have been destroyed once the clerks in London had got all the information they wanted but Shropshire Archives has a set for 1841 and Newcastle has some for 1851 that's Newcastle on time um, and there are comments made by the enumerators um, as time went on how much easier it's getting to collect the information. I think that's partly because people have been softened up, you know, by previous censuses and accepted that this was something that was going to happen. And then of course, the beginning of um, uh, universal schooling, which is normally taken to be 1870, but it wasn't quite because every um, uh, local authority could decide whether they made it compulsory in their area or they didn't. So it's sort of compulsory, but not quite. Um, and they comment that in most households, there is at least a child who can who can write by 1881. So the whole thing started rolling much more um, slickly, really. Um, but yes, the, the enumerator, we see everything through the enumerator's um, prism, you know. He collected the information. He then sort of uh, pulled it all together and wrote it out. So some disinformation might come from the householder, some mistakes uh, from the enumerator. And then, of course, you've got the further things of the transcription errors occur and the index errors occur. And I think I've come across in my family history um, examples of where the enumerator has misheard mm. what the answer that was given. Can you remember it? specific right. examples. Do you, can you remember any specific examples of that? Oh, sorry, you got muted. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm sorry. It, I, um, it was probably about five years ago that I was looking at it, and I'm afraid I haven't um, no. can't remember. The, I went looking for an example of somebody mishearing something, and I thought I, I knew an example. Um, and when I looked at it, it was very clear that somebody had misread the writing rather than misheard what was being said to them. But that was by 1891, so it's different by then. Yes. Um, what, what size area would an enumerator cover? Was it parish, town? No. Um, you can look, if you like, on the Amersham website where we've got these enumerators sort of walks. I think... Um, just out of memory, um, it was around 200 households he normally had to do. And then if he had to walk a long way to do it, he got some extra allowance for that in pay. But they would be local people doing that? Yes, yes. Um, what normally happened was that the, the 
superintendent registrar of big area, the whole of the Amersham Poor Law Union, would depute the registrars in each little area to find people to do it. Quite often it was members of the registrar's family when he couldn't manage to twist anybody else's arm, I think. And so, um, you know, they, you, well, you can see if you want to uh, check up on our, our website what the beats were. And also if you're looking online in, um, oh dear, I think it's the genealogist and ancestry, but not necessarily find my past. You can flick back and find the preliminary pages of each enumerator's book where they actually have a little description of, you know, north side of the High Street, Amersham, as far as Wealdon Street or whatever it might be. I think that might be east or west side, sorry, but you, you know what I mean. So yes, you can, you can check, you can see where they're walking. And sometimes you might need to know actually in which direction they were proceeding as it were to use a police phrase, because I knew, um, some relatives of mine lived in half of a semi-detached house and um, one half of which was a hotel but when I worked it out I managed to go and stay in the half of the house that they hadn't lived in it was the other one but at least you could see how the you know the general layout of the house worked. Whilst you've been talking Gwyneth um, a couple of people have answered about the question for 1921 so you don't need you. to try to remember so um, David said, in addition to um, the 1911 census, the following information was recorded. Um, Householders' place of employment, the industry that they worked in, the materials they worked with, their employer's name, if 15 or older, their marital status, including if divorced, if under 15, whether both parents were alive or if either or both had died, and detailed questions on education. Um, and then Peter, I think, who just asked the question, um, yeah, he said something similar about profession and branch within the profession, materials they work with, place of work and their employer's name. So that's all really, really mm. useful stuff. Um, Gary, you've just asked which website um, Gwyn is referring to. I'm sure you're doing that so that I can plug the museum website because the articles she's referring to are on within the history section of the mu museum website. So I've got some links up at the end. Uh, and another one that Gwyneth has suggested, which is um, some data put together by Cambridge University, mm. which was brilliant, I didn't know about, I'll show you at the end, um, which gives you information about number of children in school and that kind of thing. So we'll look at that at the end too. Um, we're going to move on if that's okay. So if you've got a question, there will still be an opportunity to ask, but we're going to move on now to do our focus session where we look at, usually we look at an object or something from the collection. Um, and how we're going to do that today is look at how we've used the census to better understand our collection and local stories. So um, Gwyneth and I are going to do that together. Um, so back to the beginning here. Oops. Hang on a sec. Oops. Sorry. There we are. So I'll start there. Gwyneth, I'll hand over to you. Oh, right. OK, thank you. Um, this is the workhouse. We thought it might be interesting to look at the workhouse and show how it kind of developed a little bit over time, you know, as you can see in the censuses. And I, I don't want to say too much about this, because once you start looking, stories really jump at you off the page. So I better concentrate on, on my brief. But if you look at that slide, you will see in the final column where born that most people were very much local, which is um, not surprising because the workhouse was for the Amersham Poor Law Union. But you will see a couple of people from other places. Um, one uh, about seven lines down is from a strange place. It was difficult to read in Hertfordshire. But the moment you pronounce it, you understand where it is because it's Charlie Wood, which is just down the, the tube line. And then if you look a bit further down, you can see Bridge North, Salop. And that does look like a story because this poor chap who was in the workhouse is a butler. And yet the, um, the workhouse is employing him as a waiter. So at least they're trying to make some use of his professional skills, I suppose. Most of the people there, if you look at the age column, are clearly elderly and possibly past work. But there are also a sprinkling of um, younger children. 
And up until 1883, the workhouse provided schooling for them and was bound to give them at least three hours instruction a day. And two of the women, if you look at the position in the institution column, um, are down as pauper nurses. So they were obviously being employed to look after the sick and they would have in return got some extra food and, and possibly money. So if we um, then look at uh, 1901, we're actually 50 years later, and you can see just looking at the summary page that they've now got 110 inmates, which is well down on the um, 1861 figure, which I think was 200 and something. Oh, dead on 200. Um, and then you see a number of tramps who would have been lodged in the casual wards and had their um, board and lodging and done a little bit of, re of work in return for what they were being given and then gone on their way. So if we look at the um, actual thing there, you can see, um, I know it's very difficult to read this one, but they had about, um, they had a similar pattern here, but more elderly people, hardly any people in the middle, you know, aged in their 20s and 40s, and just a few children. You've got one whole family up at the top there, the Hawks family. And then um, if we could look at the next one, um, I just wanted to show you that as a sort of stark reminder of um, the purpose of the census, which was not to help us, but it was to provide the clerks in London with the facts and figures they needed. And this is a particularly keen clerk who wants to show his supervisor he's really gone through this twice and, you know, used a really thick pencil and gone and obliterated a lot of what we'd like to see, which is sad. <laughs> Um, but if we look at 1911, um, again, it's the summary page, but this is really good because you can see how the use of the um, workhouse is changing. So a lot of people are in the new infirmary, a lot of people in the old infirmary, and in the body of the house, what you might have regarded as, as paupers, but by now they're being called inmates, um, the numbers are quite well down, I think. It's some... Um, 95 in total, 63 males and 32 uh, female. And then you get the vagrant wards. Those are the tramps coming through, perhaps in search of work, and the um, porter's lodge. And it um, reminds us, I think, that old age pensions had actually been introduced in 1908, and that had a knock-on effect on the role of the workhouse. But this also shows how the infirmary is gaining in importance and the um, workhouse is starting to morph into a hospital. And this may surprise you, but many workhouse infirmaries offered the best medical care in the area. And some even led the way in good practice in various areas. And sometimes family historians are quite shocked because they find a baby on their family tree was born in the workhouse. So there must have been some big drama around it but not necessarily. It might have been the, the doctor's view of what was the safest option for this woman who perhaps required um, you know, more skilled nursing than she could have got at home. And this um, became so prevalent that in 1904, the Registrar General sent a circular round requesting that workhouse births be disguised by the use of just an address. So they would say, you know, born um, somewhere in Wealdon Street rather than born in the workhouse and you can check addresses. There's a very good website called um, workhouses.org. And uh, so if you're suspicious, you can check um, the, all the addresses of the workhouses and see what's there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we're going to have a look at um, how the 1911 census has been really useful. So in our collection, if you can see that me with them on the screen, I'll show a little, I'll stop sharing in a minute. We have some medals from the First World War. In fact, we have a few, but these three, the three that were collectively known as Pips, Greek and Wilfred, belong to someone called Alfred James Lee. And he was born in Norwood's yard. Um, and he very sadly died in the Battle of the Somme uh, in the First World War. 
Um, we had those medals and we knew um, that they belonged to him and we had that photograph um, there of him. But we didn't know too much more about him and partly through the use of the census, the 1911 census, we were able to say a bit more about him. And what the census tells us um, is that uh, he was a farmer's labourer and he was living um, in 1911 with his parents, Harry and Edith, and with th his three surviving siblings, Rosetta, age 17, William George, age nine, and Ernest Harry, age one. His parents had been married for 18 years and they'd lost two children in that time. So that links back to what Gwyneth was saying earlier about knowing not just about children that were had survived and were alive, but children that had been lost too. Um, uh, and then he enlists and uh, he signs up. And as I say, uh, he very sadly he died in 1916 uh, when he was 20 years old. Now, the census tells us that, but um, that 1911 census has been used a lot in the production of this book, which I don't know if you can see on the screen, Amish, Amish and Remembers, which was an amazing project, um, which Gwyneth was a part of, and indeed some of you on this call might be part of, um, by the Chiltern U3A Family History Group, and they endeavoured as part of the um, centenary commemorations of the First World War to research the names principally on St Mary's War Memorial but on the local war memorials um, and uh, a book was published with biographies about all the people for whom they could find information and I think it's fair to say that the census was a really critical source of information and um, I've looked through these lots of times but looking back through them virtually all of them reference the 1911 census because it provides a base, a home, a starting point to talk about um, where those men were living before they went off to fight. That information is published in a book, but it is also available on our website. So uh, in partnership with the U3A, we put all of the biographies on our website. So I'll show you those uh, at the end. Another example of how we've used um, the census, in this case, the 1939 register, um, it, that's been so useful because it is more recent history. And one example uh, where we've used it or been able to look at it uh, is in relation to Shardlows, which many of you all know was requisitioned as a maternity hospital in the Second World War. And if you don't know it, there is a photograph of it on the right from our collection of George Ward photographs. It was the home of the uh, Lord of the Manor and it was requisitioned as a hospital. Now, in terms of what we knew about it, we knew that had happened. There was a wonderful article in Tatler with some photographs that described what it was like. And um, we knew from newspaper clippings about the numbers of babies born there. And we also had a photograph album, which I've taken a clip of, which is the photograph at the bottom left here. Um, and it was from this album that we were able, for example, to find out that the, the chief obstetrician was a woman. Her name was Dr. Beatrice Turner. And in this clipping, um, it lists the New Year's Honours List from 1946, where she was awarded an OBE. But the register gives us this insight into the number, a bit more kind of factual information, I suppose, the number of people at Shardlow's at a given moment when the hospital was first set up. So it ran from 39 to 1948. Um, and so I've taken a few extracts from the register here. So you can see um, here Shardlow's Maternity Hospital. And the first person entered on that list is Beatrice Turner with her date of birth and her marital status as single and her profession as obstetrician. It's quite interesting because um, it appears there are maybe some people, sort of staff who'd been working there already because there's a chauffeur listed. Um, uh, but when you get further down here to the bottom of the list, you start seeing state registered nurse. And that you might just be cut off the screen from where you're the, we are on Zoom, but that actually says pupil midwife. Um, just the sheer number of people there is interesting. So there's another whole page which lists um, Mostly, I think from this point onwards, these are pregnant women and bearing in mind that the hospital's fairly new, there are already some babies there. So that line there says baby, born on September the 15th, 1939. This one up here, baby, September the 19th, 1939. So it was already up and running and fully functioning by September 1939. 
And this list of names gives us an interesting insight to the women who had been sent there. And it carries on onto another page, but just a, a few more entries. So both the register and the census have been really useful for us. Um, and uh, just before we, we started, you all came in, Gwyneth and I were saying it is such a shame that after 1929, 1921, there will be such a gap before we're able to access information again. So the register is, um, you know, really super in being able to give us something in the interim. Right, before we're going to finish by doing a few sort of top tips and pitfalls of using the census, but does anyone have any questions about Amersham in particular or anything else you'd like to ask at this point? There's a question on the chat, actually I've just noticed, which says, what about a record of apprenticeships? Um, is there anything, Gwyneth, you can say about that? Um, I'm not sure quite what it means, but if somebody's in an apprenticeship, then it should be caught on the census because it would say APRA shipbuilder or something. Okay. Um, uh, records of apprenticeships earlier on are largely to do with taxation and things, but I imagine that's in relation to the census. Okay, maybe Elaine, who's asked the question, if you want to follow that up whilst we're doing the next bit, we can answer it. Yes, please. Okay. It, on, a, on a lot of the pages there's redacted names that's the modern word for struck out in black yep. can you explain why that is uh, yes i can explain partly um there's a hundred year rule so that um people um if it's a under a hundred years since they were born are not supposed to be shown unless the authorities knew they were dead and I think they were keeping that register up to date until 1991. But my brother and sister are both still alive and um, one is shown and one is not. So neither of them should be shown. But you can, um, if you think somebody is dead um, and not entitled to privacy anymore, you can get in touch with the authorities um, and say, please, can you unredact this through Find My Past or yeah. National so, Archives? So this is uh, on a census. Yeah. At the time of the census, people were still alive? No, that can't be right because they're alive anyway. I don't quite follow, Gwyneth, sorry. No, um, it, it is, um, what they do is they have a sort of rolling program where they... Um, reveal people when they've reached the appropriate date when their information is no longer privileged if you like and so find my pass every month will lift a few of these redactions and if you have so it's because some of those people could still be alive now yes yeah thank you, thank you. i've got a feeling when i was looking at that i was thinking they're probably the babies because um the mothers are likely to have died by now Mm. But uh, the babies, let's hope, are still alive. Except, I mean, we, that's what we were talking about before. So we assume the babies who are shown have already died. Oh, I see. Oh. So, so presumably, Gwyneth, would it be the case with anyone that has died that their information will be lifted? Do you have a right to remain covered up in death if it's under 100 years? you um oh dear it's it's a case of what was supposed to happen and what actually did happen i'm afraid the two aren't exactly the same ever as you will know in in family history and things but um yes they're entitled to privacy for a certain length of time and normally that's 100 years i think it is in this case it may be less but i think it's 100 years and so um if they knew in the days when this register was being used by the NHS, um, if they had notification that somebody had died or married, that information would be added. And then a, a person who died would not be eligible to be redacted because if you're dead, you're not entitled to privacy. Mm. And then they have this rolling program of when this date, you know, comes by every month, they release a few more people. Well, if you if you do uh, freedom of information and you are a relative, can you unredact someone who may still be alive? No, 
Uh, I think you have to produce a death certificate to do it. I think that's the case. I haven't tried myself. Um, Gwyneth, in the chat, um, Richard has written, um, I was a census enumerator in 1991 and surprised when nearly attacked by a little old lady that didn't want to complete it. This must have been in the case in the past that people didn't want to give their information. So again, we're back to this idea of privacy. Was that commonplace for the enumerators? Were they? I'm afraid, yes, it was. And every census, you get a number of people. Um, you get reports in the, um, the press, for example, of people not being willing. Um, I did find one only the other day. This was a more peaceful one. It says um, the work of the enumerators was clearly not altogether free from difficulty, as some curious incidents cited in the report are for sufficient to show. Sounds like the Registrar General's report. 14 schedules were sent to the Registrar General privately in order to avoid the scrutiny of the enumerator. In other words, local people poking their noses into your business, you know. Um, a spinster in the country of rather advanced age and very wealthy fastened up her doors and windows, forbidding access to the enumerator and saying a fine of £20 would not induce her to give him the required particulars. So in answer to a soothing letter, she sent her schedule privately to the Registrar General. So a bit of, um, you know, emollient <laughs> works wonders and Registrar General after Registrar General, you know, sort of put the pressure on, but very much used um, minimum force, you know, to get what they wanted, really. I suppose if you knew the enumerator, if they were local people, I can understand why you might not have wanted to give your information. Yes, I think some sort of embarrassment comes into it every now and again. Mm. And, right. and obstinacy and people who just don't want to be treated like other people, you know. Mm. Given, yes. given that we're filling in forms and or doing it online, will there, are there still to be enumerators? What, what would their yeah. role be? Mm. Well, I think not everybody can do it online. No, but you could ask for a form to fill in. Yes, I, th I imagine they'll see what comes in and then send somebody round if, if something hasn't. I don't know. My, my brother was an enumerator on Alderney, where you have a lot of, um, you know, retired colonels and admirals and this sort of thing. <laughs> and he found it very hard work because every house he went to, he was offered sherry and um, ended up sort of tacking down the road, I think. <laughs> <laughs> That sounds like another talk in itself, I think. <laughs> yes, I'm not sure if he'll be uh, able to give me the details. <laughs> <We'll see. laughs> Can I ask a question, am I? Yes, of course. Yeah, go ahead, Ewan. We've got an exercise on World War I memorial. Has anybody done an exercise on the World War II memorial? No. No. Okay. Well, One well, thing you're talking about redacted. The second person down on the World War II, second, second World War memorial, is actually a lady, which is quite unusual anyway. She was the daughter of a Methodist rector who lived in Amersham at the time. She was killed and she is still redacted on the census, on the 1939 register. Is she? Mm. Yeah. That's obviously wrong, isn't it? Well, I might take it up now, you mentioned it, but I didn't realise you could actually do that. Yes. No, it'd be wonderful if the World War II ones were done while there were still people around, you know. But I think the original team had probably had enough when they finished the long list of World War I people. <laughs> so they weren't quite ready to go on. But presumably they would only, you'd only find them if they were still civilians, because didn't you say the register wouldn't count anyone who had... Yes, it doesn't, the 1939 doesn't include anybody who'd gone into the services at that point. There is pressure on at the moment to get the um, register part two released, which is the people in khaki and then there's a part three which is people who were born during the war and that bit i think that explain the second fact that she was in the raf mm. yeah it would depend very much when when he went in you know if his call up was slower or something didn't didn't some bombs drop on that mission or a bomb and perhaps kill somebody Yep. Um, the, well, there was one in, um, well, there were a few, but there was a fatality um, in uh, on Chestnut Lane, which killed a nanny and a baby. So they would be on the um, 1939 register because the bombing campaign didn't start until 1940. Yes. They were, 
you're, yeah. but you're talking about service people, aren't you, Ewan? I think. Yes. The, la the lady I'm talking about is actually was in the RAF at the time. Mm. Eileen Kilburn. She, she was killed in 1940 or 41, I can't remember now. That's right, yeah. It might be, I don't know, Alison, we could talk about it afterwards. Alison might have a link with um, her family because her story is written up, certainly. So it might be that if they can write a letter, like you suggest, or, or maybe you can, you and... Um, uh, but it's family, the family are all dead, as far as I can find out. I was looking forward to seeing the 1921 census to double-check that. I think Ewan's lady is a different one to Eileen. Eileen's on the Cheshire Boys one, and I think Ewan's lady is on the um, Amersham Memorial. Oh, right. oh sorry. Correct. Yeah. Um, shall we move on now to finish off? Um, Gwyneth is going to give us some um, sort of pitfalls of using the census and top tips. <laughs> right, thank you. Um, well, the first slide is headed. Oh, sorry, it just takes. No, us. no, no problems. Is it that one? Yeah, great, thank you. Um, so a lot of people say, well, I can't find my relative in the census, they're not there. And occasionally it's quite true they aren't there. So I'm just looking now at, you know, possible reasons why somebody might be actually missing. And um, a number of chunks of the census did actually get, uh, get lost. The um, 1861, I think, was particularly damaged because it was stored for a long time in the rafters of the um, House of Commons, and they think that people borrowed bits of it and didn't give them back. Uh, now, if you think that that's happened, you can look at lists of what isn't there, so you can work out whether it's worth persisting or not. So there's a list on Find My Past, another list on Ancestry, and um, a more detailed list on in the National Archives. So you go into their discovery catalogue, you put in the code of the census, you know, HO107 Home Office or RG9 Registrar General for later on. Um, and you then search using the search term missing. But you also need to remember to redo the search using the term wanting because that's the more old fashioned archivist term for something which isn't there. So you'll always have a small percentage of people who are missing because perhaps they were itinerants, you know, wandering over a moor on um, census night. You have a small number who certainly want to avoid the scrutiny of any form of authority. And you also get ancestors who disappear because perhaps they're serving in the army or at sea. Some censuses do bring people like that in with more efficiency, but it's not right the way through the censuses. So people leave for work and they might even nip over a border and you know go to the Isle of Man or Scotland um, where you need to search a different range of censuses. Though Find My Past has um, transcription, index rather, sorry, of the census for Scotland. Um, and some people just, um, you know, some people died on census night, but on the whole, and I don't know whether this is always good news for people or not, the experts say that your ancestor has a 95 to 96% chance of being there. It's just that you can't find them. So um, you just have to get a bit more cunning and carry on searching. And then on the next slide, we'll look at some, um, what can possibly go wrong. <laughs> so, lots of things. I think you can divide it into disinformation, which is the wrong information, um, when people don't tell you the truth because they don't want to, and misinformation where people tell you the, try to tell you the truth but just happen to get it wrong. Now if people are lying it's always interesting because they have a motive for lying which you might like to probe and think about. Um, lots of things, as you were saying earlier, you know, things get misheard so that Tattersall shows up in the census as tortoise shell, or you get different spellings and Maxstead became McSteed. And this was really very distressing because there was an American family who um, firmly believed that they were of Scottish descent and they hired a genealogist to go into it who couldn't find anything. So they hired another one. Then they hired a third one who discovered that actually it wasn't McSteed and they'd been, you know, marching in 
and St. Patrick's Day's parades in, you know, New York and going to um, Burns Night feasts and so on for donkey's years. And he discovered that they were actually Max Deads from Essex. So um, that was a rather bit of a letdown. Then you often get the wrong surname because the surname of the head of the household will be written down and then the enumerator shoves everybody under the same label. And sometimes it's worth looking for the, the very large family ditto, which can get sort of ignorantly recorded in um, transcriptions and censuses. And um, I was looking for the wife of George Wilkie in 1901, and she isn't even ditto, you know, the wretched transcriber couldn't even recognize ditto and put her down as dit. So you'd have to do quite a bit of thinking to, uh, you know, get at that one. Um, stepchildren sometimes zigzag between surnames, perhaps, you know, they don't want to go to school under a different surname from your brothers and sisters kind of thing. And I looked at one chap who joined the army, first of all, under his um, mother's name. Um, but he lied about his age, so they chucked him out. So he joined again under his stepfather's um, name. He then went to Canada. The First World War broke out, so he came back with the Canadian Expeditionary Force under his mother's name. And then he also turns up in the um, United States um, draft cards and the way to link that is because he had quite a distinctive tattoo on his left arm which was recorded at all these <laughs> you know all these changes of name so that was quite a difficult one um, you may find initials only particularly if people are in a lunatic asylum for example where a bit of discretion might be called for and then there's what we were talking about earlier that people look at the census and try and transcribe it and they get it wrong and then the index is wrong, which is a further process and where further mistakes can come in. And then we've got modern um, errors such as Wilhelm Thomes, which are keyboard errors, essentially. You hit the, the next door key. And I believe I've even found an error which may have come from predictive texting, which um, Emily and I were talking about, because um, a certain prestigious journal uh, in its crossword wanted the Latin for widow, which is vidua, and, um, and the crossword compiler had put in video, and I reckon that's predictive, you know, texting coming in and interfering. <laughs> so that's a daunting list, but um, let's go on and look at the, um, the top tips. So handwriting, you have to remember that lots of things, lots of capital letters in Victorian handwriting are very easily confused. My Joynson relatives turn up as Toynson, for example. L and S is very easily confused. So people write in and say, I don't know what's happened. My ancestor was a, a lawyer in one census and then he turns up as a Sawyer in the next. You can almost solve that without looking at it because most lawyers don't put themselves down as lawyers. They're a barrister at law or, a, you know, an attorney or something specific. Then we have to remember that flex, spelling is flexible. If it does the job, it's absolutely fine. But we have rigid minds. You know, we've been trained that, you know, you spell things one specific way and not another. And um, so we have to try and cast that off sometimes and imagine, you know, how people might have pronounced things or, um, you know, what, what the enumerator might have done with them. Then distance can produce particular distortions. So when I was a child going on the buses, um, I remember the bus conductor singing out, Axadil. Um, and I don't know whether, supposing somebody had moved from Axadil to Essex, whether people would realize that what they were listening to was Hawkshead Hill and write it down correctly. And then if you're born in a tiny hamlet, you know, Little Piddling or somewhere in the marsh, you may get fed up of saying to people, you know, I come from so-and-so and they say, was that, never heard of it. So you start substituting the nearest big town and you might feel that with something as official as the census, then maybe you better produce something that, um, you know, is uh, more widely known. So 
you may find that you have to do a sort of contiguous parish search, you know, to find people's actual baptisms, even though they claim to have been born in Norwich or Carlisle or somewhere. And searching, um, it's a good idea to give some thought to that sort of thing. There's a very good section in um, Dave Annell's book on the census, which is co-written with Peter Christian, on how to use wild cards and, and breaking your data down so that, as, as we see from the top thing with capital letters, that's often where the whole inquiry has gone askew because the um, index will show a different capital letter from the one of the surname you know you're after. So you can get around that by doing things like, you know, somebody named John born in a particular town in a particular year. Uh, try not to put too much in at a time because you may lessen your chances of finding anything if one piece of data doesn't match up to the search criteria. And you just get used to it. If you're looking for John Smith, then you have to do targeted searches over small areas of, you know, geography or occupation or something. If you've got Obadiah Heckman Wyke or something on your tree, then you can do pretty wide searches. And sometimes it's worth looking for close relatives um, and perhaps even trying to reconstitute the whole family from a census, because often your missing family relative may be living with them. And um, think about the neighbours, because sometimes when families got numerous, one or two of the older children will be sent to live with a neighbour or an elderly relative and do things like, you know, fetching in the firewood and the water from the well and so on to pay for their lodging, really. And, um, and then five more we've got, haven't we? Um, yes, you need to think a bit about where boundaries occur between counties or registration districts, because that will affect where you find your information. Um, Ilkston, for example, is on the Derbyshire Nottinghamshire border. And when I went searching for people that I, I knew someone else had found actually in the World War I project, I was really annoyed because I couldn't find them in Ilkston because I'd shoved in Derbyshire. And when I took out Derbyshire, I found them straight away. And remember that um, we are dealing largely with pre um, 1972 county boundaries, those are the so-called historic or ceremonial counties. And if you want to check registration district areas, you can look at ukbmd.org or the website, which Emily is going to show you later on, which is more fun, I think. Children who were born and died between censuses, you might want to look at them if you're trying to give a complete picture of a family's life, you know and child mortality unfortunately was 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 considerable so you can then go to the gro website and look at their historic registers which you can search with the father's surname and the mother's surname on marriage and that should show you any babies born to the couple but again you'll have to beware of distortions with the surname and even sometimes when you find something on freebmd and you try and apply that to the GRO index, you'll find that Atkinson crops up as Hatkinson or something you hadn't expected. It's worth looking at all possible versions of the census indexes, Ancestry, Find My Past, The Genealogist and FreeSen um, are the obvious ones. And what's not always obvious is that sometimes um, other websites are using the data, particularly from Find My Past. So it's really a waste of time um, searching, you know, my heritage and so on, because that is essentially Find My Past. And then as you go, try and build up um, extra layers of cunning, really. Think about when your searches worked, when they didn't, and why, and try and see what goes wrong so that you can you know, just be a bit more resourceful. And the main thing is just don't give up, um, keep going. And the census um, indexes, they do get corrections submitted all the time so that, you know, one day somebody may have put something in which is of help to you. And those are just a few resources you might want to know about. 
Thanks, Gwyneth. Um, as I say, we are recording this session, so within the next two weeks it will be up on YouTube. So if some of the slides, there's references or things you need to take, you can just go onto YouTube and go to the point in the video where you'll be able to see the slides. So um, I'm just going to, we'll take any more questions in a second, but I just want to also um, show you um, a couple of resources uh, that we had. Um, hang on, just check the page I've got it on. Oh, that's it. Um, not this one. So um, this is the census records on the National Archives, which Gwyneth suggested is a really useful page. Um, it answers some of the questions that we've talked about today, the history of the census and some of the issues around it and the information that you can find. So um, I don't know if the toolbar is slightly in the way there. Is that more helpful? Can you see that better now? Um, uh, but we'll try and put the links up, but it's under there, National Archives, Help With Your Research, Research Guides, Census Records. The other really fun one that Gwyneth recommended is called Populations Past. Um, which, as I said before, was put together by Cambridge University. And um, I'd never seen this before, and I think it's an amazing resource. Um, so you can pick your date at the top here on the um, timeline. So you can pick the version of the census that you want to look at. So, for example, I put that on 1891. And then on the map, you go over the map to click on the area. Oh, I didn't get it right first time. Uh, Hang on, my eyesight. Uh, there we are, there's Amersham. And you can click on that and it will tell you different bits of information immediately. So there's the population, 20,454. So that will be in the district, remember. Um, it tells you the size. And there, for example, girls aged 10 to 13 who were working. And that says 4.61. And then it tells you um, what that means, you know, if it's a percentage or what it relates to. So you could click something else. So I could click boys aged 14 to 18, and I could click back again onto Amersham, and I'd get that um, nearly 47% of boys were working in 1891 between the ages of 14 and 18. But there's all sorts of different things you can look at, mortality and health, marriage, fertility, it's really brilliant, accessible way to get statistical information about the area. So um, populationspast.org um, is the URL. So I'm really grateful to Gwyneth for sharing that one with us. Um, she also mentioned some of the uh, resources that we have um, on the website. So um, if you go onto our website under history and click on history of Amersham, that's where much of this information is. And if you typed in a numerator or census, you'd get some of Gwyneth's um, articles that she mentioned. I've left up the page here for the U3A project that we've mentioned. Um, and that if you go under World War One, you'll find a link to that there, Amersham Remembers. And if I scroll down, the book that I showed you, here are all of the links um, to it and all of the biographies, each of the biographies that were written. So if you want to look into that, you can. Um, there's also a page on the website about Chardelot's babies. And many of you will know that um, the last six years we've been trying to collect data about who the babies, the 5,200 babies were who were born there. Um, we've got a good few hundred and I'd say we still get probably about at least one email a week or sometimes a couple of weeks and nothing for a fortnight, but it averages about one person a week contacts us with their details of being a Shardlow's baby. So uh, that's our method of information gathering in the absence of other, other uh, sources, but uh, do have a look. And if you know anyone who's a Shardlow's baby, uh, let us know. Um, the other resources, I think you've mentioned those, haven't you? We mentioned the, the um, Sheila Caldwell book that Annie asked about. That's called, was it called Vanishing? Vanishing for the Vote, yeah. There. Vanishing for the Vote, yeah. Um, so thank you, everyone. That's been absolutely brilliant, Gwyneth. Really, really informative session. Um, I've certainly learnt an awful lot. Um, does anyone have any questions? Oh, there's a few bits in the chat. Does anyone in the meantime have any questions they'd like to ask? I just had a, a, an observation, which is a, 
perhaps an unusual uh, you I think you said Gwyneth, the 1939 register was done on the 29th of September. Is that right? Well, unfortunately, um, while it works for most people, uh, it was in fact Friday night and therefore the Sabbath for the Jewish community. And unusually, the powers that be gave them a dispensation. So they didn't actually have to report on that day. I think it was the following Monday or sometime in the following week. Because obviously, Saturday is also a Sabbath. Sunday is a Christian Sabbath, so it probably went on to the Monday. But, um, you know, you wouldn't know that from the record because all the names are there. But uh, that's the interesting well, that's thing. That's the main thing, because ration cards were based on it. So it was a strong, you know, motive for telling the authorities your details. Thank you, Peter. There is um, a comment here um, from Elaine saying, when I was looking at the census documents on Find My Past, I came across some records, not census, of family members in, in apprenticeships. What do you know about a register of apprenticeships? This was for the 17th or 18th century? Yes, um, it's to do with tax. It's in the um, National Archives and it's IR1, Inland Revenue 1. Um, and the tax went from 1710 um, to 1804. Um, but because it's, it's a register of who paid tax on apprenticeships, it doesn't cover uh, times when an apprenticeship was set up within a family and it also doesn't cover pauper apprenticeships because they were not subject to tax and there is um, a very good um, index to it and um, I think the I think it was the Society of Genealogists did one but you can you can look it up on the um, National Archives website and there'll be a guide sheet for it. Thank you. There's another question, um, which is how can an adopted baby, I think it means be found, if they have a change of name between censuses? With difficulty, I'd imagine. Yes, the, the big problem there is that um, before, I think it was 1926, adoptions could be done on a purely informal basis, and so there's no paper trail to follow. After that, you get um, court papers and you get um, um, family uh, court um, registration of the old name and the new name. So you can you can actually track things a bit. But um, in the 19th century, it's very, very informal. I've got one I only knew about because um, the, the boy it concerned was obviously invited at some point it must have been six or seven or maybe five because his writing is not very very good but he was invited to write his name in the family bible and that was the only way I knew of his existence um, and he can be found on the census first of all as a nurse child because his mother um, got whisked away from where they were living gave birth to him in Stockport and there was a good woman just round the corner who took the child in probably almost straight away. So he's there under his um, mother's surname of Duckworth in, I think it's the 1888 census? No, before that, 1871, because she died in um, 1873. And after that, he was taken into his birth family whose surname was Rose. And that's the surname he grew up with. But it was just that one fleeting trace, you know, if he hadn't been invited to sign the family Bible, I wouldn't have known. The, the people who descended from him did track him back and we got in touch at some point. But um, it's difficult, it's really difficult because, you know, you, you don't know exactly what happened. Um, and, you know, you, you don't get a very precise birth date, do you? in the censuses so you, again it's something you can't really track okay I'm i can't offer much hope there can i i'm sorry well it can't give us everything can it unfortunately no. um and then there's a, just a final comment that says although my heritage uses um find my past data find my past has good wildcard searching whereas my heritage doesn't so that's just a that's a, really useful thank you 
So thank you everyone for joining us. Um, I'm sure we could go on with more questions, but we have actually run over quite a bit today, but thank you. It's just <laughs> made lots of great, great comments and contributions. And Gwyneth, thank you so much. You know, you have a huge amount of knowledge as well as of experience of using the census. So I'm really grateful um, for you to share that with us this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thanks for being such a lovely audience. <laughs> and I think everyone's giving you a clap, which you thoroughly deserve. Um, we will make this available as soon as possible um, on YouTube. So some of the previous episodes are already on YouTube, apart from the Weller one, which is only a podcast at the moment. Um, although I was really pleased to hear that it has been listened to as far away as New Zealand. So um, we are getting there. Um, but the others, if you just put type in YouTube Amersham Museum into Google, you'll find the others. And this one will be up soon. We're back again in two weeks time uh, when we're looking at the Playhouse Theatre. Stan Pretty is going to tell us a little bit about the early life of the Playhouse and we're going to look at some of the programmes and images we have in our collection. And Alison is going to be back telling us a little bit about the cinema. Um, so I look forward to seeing you then. Um, and in the meantime, um, enjoy the good weather and uh, we'll be at the end of March next time. So it's very exciting. The rules will actually have changed a little bit. Uh, although we will still be on Zoom. So thanks everyone for coming today uh, and we'll see you soon.